Hello and welcome to the Geocurrents Lecture Series on the Historical Geography of U.S. Presidential Elections. Today's lecture will be rather short. It only covers two elections, 1968 and 1972, uh, which we can designate as the Nixon era. I will begin, however, with the period leading up to the 1968 election, that after the election uh, of Lyndon Johnson as president in 1964 in a landslide election, which was covered in the previous lecture. Uh, after Johnson's uh, victory, he sets into motion what he called the Great Society Program, uh, essentially a continuation of the New Deal of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, there are a number of very important Congressional acts passed and signed by Johnson during this period, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which uh, finally sets in the process of enfranchising black voters in the South. The Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, which overturns the 1924 Immigration Act that greatly restricted immigration to the United States and essentially prohibited it from most Asian countries. Uh, so this is going to open up the gates of immigration. It begins slowly at first, but then picks up steam. The Food Stamp Act of 1964 establishes the Food Stamp Program. Uh, there's some educational acts, like the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, and the act that created the Medicaid Program. So you can see in the illustration below that Johnson portrayed himself as a successor to Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, John Kennedy, and then Johnson, and uh, furthering the program of Roosevelt. Uh, not long afterwards, however, the uh, left-wing counter-cultural revolution uh, was underway. A lot of this was in reaction to the Vietnam War. Uh, fighting was intensifying. Uh, draft was um, intensified as well. More and more young men were sent to fight in Vietnam. And the war was not going particularly well. Uh, so we had the Vietnam summer in this year. The countercultural movement, in, in a larger sense, is taking off as well. The illustration is from Haight-Ashbury with a love sign put it underneath it. The summer of love in Haight-Ashbury was the next year, 1967. But this whole um, movement is underway. And I note that the term generation, generational gap was often used at the time, but in retrospect, it was more like a generational chasm that emerged in this period. Partly uh, in reaction against this, there's a Republican surge in 1966. Now, that's not uncommon for the party out of power to gain seats in the midterm elections, uh, but this was a particularly uh, striking one. You can see the Republicans gained 47 seats at the Democrats' expense. The Democrats still way outnumbered uh, Republicans in the House, 248 to 187, but it's still a, a very striking change. And you can see the dark red on the map. Those are Republican gains over much of the West, Midwest, um, uh, uh, southern part of the uh, Midwest especially, a number of um, congressional districts in the South as well, although the Democrats did pick up some in the South. That's uh, under, uh, in the election of... Uh, 1964, the Republicans gained tremendously in the South, well, particularly on the presidential side, but they picked up some uh, congressional seats as well. Um, the Republicans gained up three, gained three Senate seats as well, but note they're still in a, um, a minority of far from the Democrats, 36 to 64. In 1968, the Republicans nominate uh, Richard Nixon, ran in 1960, barely lost, uh, Nixon was thought to be over politically. Uh, he ran for governor of California in 62 and lost, and the, many thought that was the end of his political career. He went to New York, started building uh, up his political connections, um, sort of planning for a, a return to politics, uh, and in 1968 was successfully nominated. He withstood challenges from both the left and right of the Republican Party. So from the left... Uh, uh, was Nelson Rockefeller of New York, very much the kind of the archetypical establishment uh, Republican um, center of the road on most issues, uh, left leaning on a few uh, social and cultural issues um, as well. Reagan, on the other hand, uh, governor of California, who uh, 
uh, ran from the conservative side. He's one of these conservative fusionists. Uh, Barry Goldwater was the archetypical uh, member of that group. Uh, I talked in the previous le uh, lecture about uh, William F. Buckley at the National Review, forging this new synthesis of cultural conservatives, uh, classical liberals, or I may say libertarians who wanted uh, uh, government out of the economy and uh, more free enterprise and individual autonomy, uh, I suppose, is, is the way they would probably put it. So this is a big divide in the Republican Party. And we can see it uh, very clearly on the map. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller won the primaries in New York and Massachusetts. Uh, but uh, Nixon did quite a bit better uh, winning most of the primaries in the, in the Midwest. Uh, Ronald Reagan taking uh, California. Uh, Nixon was acceptable to both uh, factions. Uh, as I said before, he was a very firm anti-communist, uh, but in on domestic issues, uh, he was more, more center-right. Uh, the anti-war movement uh, opposed to the Vietnam War at this time turned against uh, Lyndon Johnson and embraced uh, Eugene Mac uh, McCarthy, sen Democratic senator from Minnesota. The illustration I have here is a sign uh, uh, labeled Coming Clean for Gene. This was the phenomenon of young people who were associated with the counterculture, hippie movement, if you will, many of whom had long, uh, men had long hair and beards. So coming clean for Gene meant cutting your hair, shaving your beard, uh, wearing more conventional clothing, and then campaigning for McCarthy. Uh, and there were quite a few people who did that. Uh, and in uh, the first primary in New Hampshire was a shock to the nation, and certainly a shock to uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson. Johnson uh, won that election, but with less than 50% uh, of the votes. McCarthy came pretty close, uh, essentially 42%. Uh, this was a total uh, shock to Johnson and others in the Democratic uh, establishment. And then Johnson, uh, well, in turn, he shocked the country by withdrawing from the election, uh, famously saying, I shall not seek and will not accept the nomination to the party. So that threw everything open. Suddenly, it's a, it's a wide open game. Uh, Robert Kennedy, uh, younger brother of John F. Kennedy had been attorney general at one time. Anyway, he uh, enters the, the race. He's also embraced by the anti-war movement. Uh, he's a little bit more of a conventional New Deal Democrat in some ways than McCarthy. Uh, between them, Kennedy and McCarthy win most of the primaries. You can see McCarthy uh, winning in Massachusetts, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Illinois, Oregon, um, uh, Kennedy in Indiana, South Dakota, Nebraska, and probably most importantly, California. Uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, only in that first, uh, that first primary in New Hampshire because he withdrew. Uh, Hubert Humphrey, um, a vice president under uh, uh, Johnson, uh, entered the race but did not uh, run in primaries. He had surrogates run for him, and you could see that uh, on the map, essentially. In the same year, uh, in April, uh, Martin Luther King is assassinated. Uh, racial strife ensues, uh, massive uh, rioting over much of the country, uh, really uh, causing a lot of, of, of damage and showing a deep level of, of discontent, uh, particularly in inner city black communities. Uh, uh, one thing that's happening is the uh, civil rights agenda is progressing, but uh, the economic uh, benefits are certainly not uh, flowing into black communities. Uh, after he uh, wins the California uh, Democratic primary, Robert Kennedy is assassinated, and the nation is then thrown into crisis. A real um, sort of soul-searching results in the country uh, after, after having faced so many um, assassinations of Martin Luther King, John Kennedy before him, and now Robert Kennedy. Uh, the Democratic National Convention that year was marked by chaos. This is very much an understatement from the Wikipedia. The event was among the most tense and confrontational political conventions in American history. I mean, I can't think of another one that even comes close with the police clubbing uh, demonstrators uh, in, the, in the streets of Chicago, uh, which got a lot of national attention. Uh, as it turns out, Vice President Hubert Humphrey is pretty easily nominated, despite having no primary wins. Uh, he had support from the uh, party insiders and bosses, if you will. Uh, 
Uh, this certainly infuriated the party's left wing. Uh, uh, Hubert Humphrey had not been particularly vocal about uh, Vietnam uh, and the Vietnam Project. He felt he had to continue with it because that was part of the Cold War Democratic Party uh, features that they would be hard, tough on communism internationally to help them uh, push through their domestic agenda. Uh, at the convention, though, a, a sort of watered-down anti-war plank was endorsed. Humphrey said that he would not escalate any further or just try to seek to wind down the war. But the anti-war movement had little faith in him and um, were, were, were pretty pretty skeptical about the whole thing. Uh, a failed contender for the Democratic nomination, George Wallace, uh, continuing the old Dixiecrat line of Southern Democrats who did not uh, believe in racial integration. Yeah, far from it. Um, uh, did not, obviously did not get the nomination. Uh, again, he leaves the Democratic Party. Uh, this had happened before. Strom Thurmond back in 48. Uh, and he run, run, runs under the American Independent Party banner. He was polling quite well, uh, and not just in the South, also in a lot of working class communities in the North. Uh, and he actually got as high as 21% uh, in late September, but those numbers dropped after his vice presidential pick. That's Curtis LeMay. But I'd like to read you a couple quotations of George Wallace on uh, race, and then some from Curtis LeMay. So Wallace said that, uh, In the name of the greatest people who have ever trod the earth, I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny and say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. <coughs> and he also said at another occasion that uh, Lyndon, President Lyndon Johnson wants, to turn us, wants us all to be one race. The American people, black and white, do not want to mix. And then Curtis LeMay, uh, Curtis LeMay had been... Uh, in the Air Force in, uh, in World War II, he was the main architect of the strategic bombing program that uh, firebombed German cities, uh, killing uh, uh, millions of people, uh, certainly hundreds of thousands, uh, destroying cities of questionable strategic relevance, although historians debate about that. But he wanted to use the same strategy in Vietnam, uh, wanted to bomb the Vietnamese back to the Stone Age, and says uh, one quote here, I think there are many times when it would be most efficient to use nuclear weapons. I do not believe the world would end if we exploded a nuclear weapon. He wanted so bombing, um, uh, using tactical nuclear weapons in North Vietnam. That did not go over very well. Uh, so anyway, Nixon campaigns on law and order. There had been a lot of riots. Uh, crime was rising. Uh, this is a, was it become a... a common feature of Republican campaigns. And this was one of the first times when it was uh, really important in an election. And in the election, uh, Nixon wins the Electoral College quite uh, handily. You could see uh, 301 electoral votes, uh, where Hubert Humphrey gets uh, 191, Wallace gets 46. Uh, so that wasn't particularly close. But notice how close the popular uh, uh, vote was, uh, 40, uh, 30, 40 uh, 3.4% for Nixon, 42.7% uh, for Humphrey, and 135 for Wallace. This led to a lot of calls to uh, eliminate the Electoral College, and this was probably the close. well, it is the closest the country ever came to eliminating it was after this election, uh, which I've talked about before. Uh, as far as the map goes, uh, uh, Nixon won most of the country, you know, all of the West except the state of Washington, almost all of the Midwest except Michigan and uh, Minnesota. Uh, Humphrey did best in the Northeast, uh, winning every state there in New England and the Mid-Atlantic states except uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, New Jersey, and Delaware. Uh, in the South, uh, Humphrey won uh, Texas, partly because of his a close association with Lyndon Johnson from Texas. And then you could see Wallace winning uh, a, a lot of Southern states, not, not all of them by any means, but Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. If we look at the county level map, we can see uh, a pretty red map. There are definitely some uh, blue Democratic strongholds. We've talked a lot about those before, so I don't need to go into the uh, specific uh, uh, geography of them. 
in the South, you can notice uh, how much better um, Humphrey did in Texas than other states. And then uh, that strong level of support for uh, Wallace uh, in the Deep South, although not much in South Carolina. I'll talk about uh, South Carolina in a little while. But I, before I do that, I want to talk about a couple of states that have really had their electoral geography inverted or, or turned upside down. So one would be the uh, state of Maine. So you can see here, uh, uh, back in 1968, the Democratic candidate Humphrey did best in uh, the more rural parts of the state, uh, more sparsely populated, although he did take uh, Portland, uh, whereas Nixon won in the um, coastal area. Uh, the central part of the state, fishing-oriented economy, uh, a lot of tourism in some areas. But then uh, you look at the uh, Harris-Trump election of, of 2024, and you can see it's almost flipped, uh, where uh, Harris did very well in the coastal uh, counties, uh, best in the county containing Portland, but took all, almost all those coastal counties. And then the interior uh, more sparsely populated areas went, uh, in some cases, overwhelmingly for Trump. If we look at our, uh, our cartogram here, you've got to remember this is by no means perfect, but it's scaling counties in terms of their population. Uh, you could see that most uh, urban counties were uh, blue. Yeah, you could see um, not just Boston, but uh, suburban counties uh, around it in an upper uh, right, you know, quite a dark blue, and you can see uh, New York City, with the exception of Staten Island, and you can, if you look closely, you can see uh, urban areas like uh, Detroit, Wayne County, Cook County, Chicago, Hennepin County, uh, Minneapolis, uh, uh, Allegheny County with Pittsburgh, Cuyahoga County with Cleveland, uh, and so on. Uh, one exception, though, at, at this time is the, the Southwest, the uh, urban counties were decidedly Republican voting, and that's true from Texas all the way across to Southern California. So I've done call-outs for um, the county containing Houston, with, with that's uh, Harris County, uh, as well as that containing uh, Dallas, uh, Maricopa County with Phoenix, San Diego County with San Diego, uh, Los Angeles County with Los Angeles. In between San Diego and Los Angeles is Orange County, which was um, often record, reckoned the most conservative county in the country, at least the most conservative large uh, or populous county at that time. And it's interesting to look at California, and again, to see how things have changed. So uh, in 68, uh, there was a big difference between Northern and Southern California. And I've, there are many ways to divide the North from South. I've uh, made a division in a heavy black line based on counties. And you can see South of that divisional line, um, South and East, but the, the, uh, the East really fits in the South because you can't cross the Southern Sierra Nevada mountain range. There are no there are no passes and there's no way across. So it's really linked in much more to the South. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, you can see in the South, uh, all counties south of that line, south and east, you can see all counties are red, uh, some quite red, like Orange County. Uh, it's much more mixed in the North, but if you were to scale this for population, you'd see that the North is very clearly on the Democratic side in the Bay Area, all the counties except Marin uh, and, and Santa Cruz, if you want to include that in the Bay Area, uh, are blue on this map. And this is really when the Bay Area starts uh, turning strongly Democratic in its voting pattern. And that's where most of the population is uh, as well. Uh, there was a strong desire at this time uh, among people in the North to split the state. I remember this quite well. Uh, I was, uh, at this time, 11, 12-year-old child uh, living in the Bay Area, and it was just commonplace among virtually everybody I know that the state should be divided, that uh, Southern California, which was generally referred to by people in the North simply as L.A., uh, with, with no, no real knowledge of the differences from one uh, area, city, or county to another, uh, but almost uni universally disparaged, which in retrospect I think was some uh, pretty pretty deep regional prejudice and also a feeling that uh, uh, Northern California at one time was the population center and it's been uh, 
overshadowed by the upstart South. But anyway, there was a lot of animosity and a, a strong desire to divide the state. Today, it's a completely different electoral geography. It's coast versus interior. Uh, and so you never hear talk about splitting northern and southern California anymore. At least I never hear it. Now, as I mentioned before, there's an inter interesting thing about this uh, election that South Carolina, uh, historically the most um, conservative southern states, particularly on uh, issues of race and civil rights, uh, had been the leader of a lot of these um, movements away from the Democratic Party uh, because it was a fear a fear that it would um, be advocating for uh, racial integration and voting rights. But yet in 60, uh, in 68, it, uh, it voted for Nixon uh, rather than George Wallace. And you can really attribute it to one person, Strom Thurmond, who had been the Dixiecrat candidate in 48. But he believed that Wallace would not win the election in the Northeastern Urban liberalism would continue to dominate if he uh, endorsed Wallace because that would that would uh, help uh, Humphrey. So he really took the stump for Nixon, and party organizations were were quite powerful in those days. Well, they still are to some extent, but even more so then. Uh, and that was able to uh, he was able to put uh, South Carolina in the Nixon camp. Uh, looking at the voting patterns, we had the uh, pretty typical voting patterns of. Uh, of those periods, although it's a little more interesting because we have a, a Wallace uh, in here, so uh, we have percentage votes, and you could see that uh, Nixon uh, did best with the highest income groups, so high income. They're not telling us how they're dividing this, but you know, uh, pretty much um, a two to one voting for Nixon, and then uh, as you go down um, into the low income groups, uh, overwhelmingly for Humphrey. And uh, ethnic, what we might call ethnic groups, we still had in some cities, Italian neighborhoods, Slavic neighborhoods, pretty much gone now. They were disappearing at this time, uh, but um, overwhelmingly for Humphrey. Uh, uh, Nixon uh, had uh, a, a lot of, uh, of, of problems uh, in his... Uh, in his uh, presidency, in the, his, his first presidency after 1968. Uh, one was he had, had promised to uh, uh, have peace with honor in Vietnam. That was the, the, the policy. But in the first couple of years, he was intensifying the war effort, uh, in particular by taking the war effort out of South Vietnam into Cambodia and Laos. North Vietnamese, North Vietnamese were infiltrating troops and war material into South, South Vietnam through Cambodia and Laos under the so-called Ho Chi Minh Trail. And under Nixon, the U.S. Air Force started bombing. Oh, they intensified the bombing of that area using, using also mass defoliants. And there was a, a particularly intensive uh, a bombing episode in, in 70 that led to uh, major uh, demonstrations in U.S. colleges. And at a relatively little-known Ohio State school called Kent State, uh, the National Guard fired on peacefully demonstrating students. Uh, four were killed, nine were uh, injured. This was uh, seen as a, um, you know, just a, a travesty and a, a, a national uh, tragedy uh, cover of Life magazine, which Life magazine uh, was a major publication in those days. You can see it's a front and center. Uh, so probably no surprise, the Republicans are going to, uh, are experienced losses in the 1970 midterm elections, although not that extreme. You could see uh, dropping uh, 12 seats. But considering the fact that Democrats already had a major lead, that's a, a pretty uh, a big blow, and especially considering uh, that they had the presidency at this time. Uh, well, but that's in a way par for the course. Uh, the party that controls the presidency more often than not loses seats in a midterm election. So it's not a, a huge loss, but you can see a gain of a lot of a Democratic uh, House seats, particularly in the West and the upper Midwest, which is uh, interesting because these have been noted as uh, quite Republican-leaning parts of the country. So now we're finally move, move, moving into the 1972 election. There's a, a crowded Democratic field want to take on Nixon and try to get the uh, presidency again. Uh, George McGovern of South Dakota uh, wins most of the primaries and wins the nomination. And this is under uh, uh, new rules that he had helped design. I talked before in previous lectures about the McGovern-Fraser 
a committee seeking to reform the party uh, after that sort of disastrous 1968 uh, convention process. But you can see on the map, McGovern did extremely well in the West and in the Northeast, uh, which is interesting. Uh, taking Massachusetts and New York uh, and, and most Western states, including the, the big one, uh, California. Uh, Wallace did very well in the South, but note he took Michigan as well. So Wallace definitely had appeal to uh, white labor in the North. There was a lot of racial tension at this period uh, due to uh, riots that occurred after the, the assassination of Martin Luther King and sort of continuing unrest. Um, you, know, you could see uh, uh, Hubert Humphrey uh, um, uh, running yet again and doing quite well in the Midwest, uh, uh, Pennsylvania as well, uh, West Virginia, so taking a number of, of states. And it's a pretty equal division of, if you just total up the primary votes with Humphrey getting 25%, McGovern getting 25%, Wallace 23%. Uh, but the uh, convention itself was, uh, was, was very diverse, uh, much more diverse than previous ones because of the McGovern-Fraser uh, 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 findings, uh, recommendations. And so you had uh, a lot more um, women, a lot more members of uh, racial um, minorities. Uh, and it turned out to be the most left-wing convention in George McGovern, uh, the anti-war uh, uh, most strongest anti-war candidate is nominated. And the 72 platform is by far the most left-wing platform uh, that the Democratic Party had pushed through in, uh, in, in modern uh, history. Uh, well, since, I suppose you could say since the Great Depression. Uh, it called for an immediate end of the Vietnam War, called for national health insurance. This is something Harry Truman had pushed for earlier and failed to get. It pushed for the Equal Rights Amendment for uh, women. A full employment by federal action. So in other words, if there's unemployment, the federal government would step in to create jobs. A reduced military spending, arms control, affirmative action in education, criminal justice reform, end of death penalty, pro-choice, which was, uh, was before Roe Ro v. Wade, uh, and much more environmental uh, protection. Environmental issue really came on strong in 1970 with the first Earth Day. Uh, it was very obvious that economic growth was resulting in appalling levels of air and water pollution, reduction in natural habitat, and it really came to national attention. This was part of the countercultural wave of the period to really put environmental issues front and center. The Republican platform, obviously uh, much more uh, uh, right-wing, but it wasn't really uh, far right in most cases. They're still pushing the peace with honor in Vietnam, but a strong national defense and tough penalties for crime. Also a very common Republican refrain about fiscal responsibility and problems of the debt. Wanted welfare reform, in other words, um, tightening uh, 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 restrictions on, on welfare uh, expenditures. Uh, a right-wing uh, economic policy with more free enterprise, tax cuts, and less regulation in favor of individual merit, uh, opposing affirmative action or quotas, but also um, seeking detente or reduced tensions with the Soviet Union and opening relations with China, which is what Nixon did, the so-called playing uh, the China card. So China and the Soviet Union had been close allies in the 50s. They were, were now in a very tense relationship. And Nixon decided that by um, developing diplomatic ties with China and starting to develop trade with them, that would pull China out of the, uh, sort of the, the uh, Soviet-centered communist camp. Well, they had already distanced themselves from the Soviet Union, uh, but uh, this was seen as a card to play against the Soviet Union. Uh, but the Republicans also wanted uh, more environmental protection and also wanted the Equal Rights Amendment, which never was to pass. And the election is an absolute landslide, the presidential election. I put that in. I put uh, presidential in italics because the Republicans gain only 12 House seats, and they're still 50 seats below the Democrats. Now, to be sure, some of those Democrats in Congress are relatively conservative, or in some cases quite conservative Southerners. Uh, the Democrats uh, actually gain two Senate seats, and they have 14 more than the Republicans. Uh, but as far as the Electoral College goes, it was an absolute wipeout. Uh, uh, McGovern took only Massachusetts and the District of Columbia, which now has electoral votes. Uh, uh, and the, 
popular vote was a landslide as well, uh, 60.7% as opposed to 375 And if we look at the county level map, I mean, this, this is where it really strikes the eye. Uh, in the south, you can see just a handful of blue counties, and those are all, um, almost, almost all of them have uh, black majorities. And we are now in a, a position because of the Voting Rights Act that blacks are uh, being enfranchised and are voting. Uh, in South Texas, that's a, a very heavily Hispanic area. Uh, Northern New Mexico, very heavily Hispanic area as well. Uh, had been since before the United States was formed. Uh, we can see a cluster of blue counties in South Dakota and Minnesota. Uh, you know, South Dakota is where McGovern was from, and he had sort of his base there. And uh, Minnesota had a strong um, sort of left-wing orientation through their own uh, former labor political party, which merged with the Democratic Party. Uh, and then we can see um, we can see a few urban industrial counties. We can see a few counties with major colleges like Dane County in southern Wisconsin with the University of Wisconsin, uh, some mining counties, uh, most of Massachusetts. But otherwise, it is a red and dark red map. Uh, despite Nixon's right-wing reputation, well, they're well-deserved, uh, many of his accomplishments uh, as as, uh, as as president, either in his first or his uh, second term, uh, uh, really lean to the left. Uh, more environmental legislation than any other president, except perhaps Theodore Roosevelt, uh, Clean Air Act, Clean uh, Water Act, Environmental Protection Agency established, National Environmental Policy Act. I should say a lot of uh, very conservative Republicans would would be happy to repeal both uh, the National Environmental uh, Policy Act and, and some of the others. Uh, Endangered Species Act has a lot of opposition these, through these days. Supplementary Social Security, uh, Title IX, OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Act, uh, expansion of affirmative action, uh, more self-determination for uh, Native Americans, and strategic arm limitations. Uh, with the Soviet Union, so it is uh, it's by no means a hardcore right-wing agenda. A lot of this was because Nixon was a pretty canny political operator. He sensed where the country was and wanted to um, meet some of these challenges, uh, particularly on environmental issues. But he is soon to uh, completely undermine himself uh, during the election campaign of 72, uh, burglars associated with the Republican Party had entered the Watergate complex offices of the Democratic Party, stolen information. Eventually that comes out, and it comes to Nixon. Nixon was never uh, directly associated with Watergate, but he was with the cover-up, uh, uh, which was quite extensive. His fate was sealed when it was revealed that uh, discussions in the Oval Office were being recorded. And uh, someone he or someone in his administration erased uh, a lot of those the more damaging recordings, and uh, that led uh, to the end. And so, two years after this just ma amazing landslide election, uh, he's forced through forced to resign, uh, and Gerald Ford uh, um, becomes president. Um, um, Ford had been vice president, became vice president after Nixon's previous vice president, Spiro Agnew, had to resign over corruption charges. Uh, so Ford becomes president to, f to fill the last uh, a couple of years of, uh, of Nixon's second term. Uh, he's a relatively moderate uh, Republican uh, from Michigan, uh, had been a House minority leader, that's a very unfortunate president. He, presidency. He really uh, hurt himself probably by pardoning Nixon, but also under his watch, the uh, South Vietnam government collapses. There's a humiliating U.S. retreat. Uh, also, the worst economy since the 1930s. Uh, I won't, I'll talk about this in the next lecture at greater length, but this is the era of stagflation, which means a stagnant economy with inflation, which was not supposed to really be possible. There's the first energy crisis, uh, and it is very bad conditions, but 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 uh, they they are improving, which is interesting. So you could see uh, two graphs here of the monthly uh, uh, inflation, and you can see a real peak uh, uh, being reached there uh, uh, in '74, and then declining. And the uh, unemployment in the period another real peak, but it's declining. Uh, but those uh, negative economic circumstances uh, are really going to hurt him in the next election, which will be the subject. 
of the next lecture, along with, along with the elections after that. So thank you yet again for tuning in to the Geocurrence uh, lecture on historical geography of U.S. presidential elections, and I hope you can listen to others. Thank you.